Welcome to Opera Holland Park on Saturday, July the 17th, between 2 and 4 in the afternoon. We'll be bringing you the first ever word in your park from this very pleasant, airy, covered but socially distant auditorium. So Word in Your Park is going to be a weatherproof event, we're under canvas, but we have taken the precaution of booking two hours of blistering sunshine just in case, and it's going to be us and some old pals of ours involved in two hours of rock and roll storytelling, involving Gary Crowley, Leslie Ann Jones, uh, Barney Hoskins, and others to be announced. There'll be mood-altering drinks available, and who knows, crisps. It's been a long, cold, lonely winter, so it'll be good to see you here. Get your tickets at the link below. See you there. Welcome to another Word in Your Attic. We were delighted to be joined by musician, writer, and keeper of his father's flame, I suppose it's fair to say, Ahmet, Ahmet Zappa. Nice to see you. Where do we find Great you, Ahmet? I am in my uh, home office in Los Angeles, uh, talking to you via my cell phone. <laughs> right. well, isn't that a miracle? In itself. Yes. Well, very, really nice to see you. Um, we're we're going to no. we want to, we're gonna talk about uh, what you got there. Oh, right. Is that a picture of you and Dad? Wow. Oh, that's uh, lovely. With um, me and my, my little teddy bear. Oh, very <laughs> good. Well, look, that, that, that really links into the question we traditionally ask first. Can you remember the music playing machinery that was in your home when you were a child? I mean, record players, tape players, and so forth. Do you have toy things, or did you have super hi-fis? What can you remember? Oh, uh, I don't think I could tell you the the brands, but, no. but uh, I mean, other than we had a lot of Sony gear, but yeah, uh, music... Um, was super important. I heard the majority of the music I was listening to was my dad's. Um, so uh, I, I do enjoy music with odd time signatures because of it. But, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, his record collection was around. Um, let's see. What was he playing? What kind of, so, you know, when you were about, I don't know, four or five in your earliest memories, can you remember the kind of things that he'd be playing in the, in the house? Yeah, I mean the, the stuff I remember thinking, which is not true. Uh, you know, one one holiday, he gave me a cassette tape where he had drawn all over the cassette all these baby snakes, and he gave me the song "Baby Snakes," and uh, with it, um, a Sony Walkman, but not like uh, I don't know, maybe it wasn't a Walkman. It was it was more of like what you would take to. Um, record someone for interviews so it's like a it's a professional grade you had the you know, handle that would yeah, slide yeah, yeah. out mm. very heavy you know brick like um you know recording device with a microphone so i could make my own radio shows and stuff like that but i i played the song baby snakes which i, I thought he made for me um he, he made the cassette for me but i, I just played that non-stop <laughs> What and how did how did your musical taste develop as you were growing up? I mean, it, it, it that had a profound effect on you, the music that you heard around, or did you, in any sense, rebel against it? Uh, well, my my brother is five years older, and my sister is seven years older, so you know the the studio is available in in the house to that's if i wanted to see my dad I'd go downstairs right or if he, you know he was either working or on tour so um really the 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 music i was very engaged with was his frank would sometimes ask us to go down and play so you know one of my proudest moments was bringing um uh, a song i sang on to show and tell at preschool Right, <laughs> that was pretty awesome. That's I remember cool. all the other kids were bringing like an action figure or something. I'm like, "This is my record. This is my single." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so, so yeah. I, I mean, there'd be these good moments. There's this. I, I can't remember what kind of a uh, uh, synthesizer it was. It just had 
so many different lights. You were drawn to it as a kid. It was just an, an immense beast of a, of a um, synthesizer. And, you know, Frank would sit each one of us down and hit record, and we would just all kind of play melodies and things. So somewhere in the vaults are, you know, hours of us playing away. Not that I was ever, you know, taught how to play the piano. That made zero difference to Frank. Uh, it was always a story you know, that, that that fascinated me because I always tried to imagine what it'd be like having Frank Zappa as your father. There was a story that he'd recorded Moon Unit and Dweezil rowing, I think, uh, in their bedroom yeah. or something, and then played it back very loudly under their bedroom doors later on as a kind of the, uh, cautionary way of kind of uh, getting them to realise what their behaviour was like. Is that true that he did that? Yeah, they were fighting about something and... Uh, I don't know if my mother handcuffed them to each other or just locked them in into the same room <laughs> and, and and recorded them. So they had nowhere to go, and you know they played back their their argument, uh, and and you know I think they've been as thick as thieves as thick as thieves ever since. <laughs> so you say all the all this stuff as. Uh is in the archive and now you're current tell us about your your current situation because you 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 oversee the estate is is that mm -hmm. right is that the right to say and so i'm fascinated by this whole business what's involved in this if you can if you can possibly tell us what do people not understand about about looking after the legacy of of somebody as prolific as your father Tell us about um, that. I, I mean, it's it's it really is a lot of a lot of work, um, and I don't know if it's the same for everyone. But in in the case of you know Frank, he was so prolific, and and there's so much media. Um, you know, a lot of the things I have to do is figure out ways to pay for the costs of, um, you know, making sure that the tape doesn't just disintegrate. Uh, and you know, we, we got a lot of help actually from Frank's fans. Uh, when Alex Winter started uh, the, the documentary, um, I wasn't really aware of the state of the problems in the vault, and my mother had just passed, and you know, the, the trust actually was kind of you know, it's, it's actually in bad shape, it was upside down. There's you know a lot of miscommunication and family infighting and, you know, stuff that's actually pretty boring and felt, <laughs> felt pretty, um, uh, it's just bad, you know, <laughs> just bad feelings. And you're like, I look, I don't know how uh, trusts are run and there's new rules that I didn't know you could have in your own life. You know, it's just a, a it was a real adjustment. And I, and I don't know that that's the same for everyone, or I'm sure there's some similarities. And I don't even know if I'm answering this question properly in the uh, answer give that us you some want, idea. Just give us some idea of the scale of the vault. I mean, how many recordings are we talking about? But I mean, how many recordings do you think you've got logged in there? I mean, it's, it's, it's between video assets and audio assets. I mean, yeah, it's, it's thousands. Tens, that, tens I of mean, thousands. Tens yeah. of thousands. And these yeah. are what? These are just experiments that he tried out in the studio? They were unreleased tracks? Are there any whole albums that he didn't put out? And what's the nature of it? You were constantly, um, constantly discovering new things. Uh, it really runs the gamut because you can see something written on a, on a tape box and you don't know what's on it until you give it a listen. Um, some of it's more accurately, you know, uh, described on on the box and then sometimes uh, just that description you feel is going to be the uh the entirety of of you know that audio but it, it goes in different directions you know so you, there's there are things that are pretty obvious like you know this will be a master of a particular record but then there might be an alt uh version of these things so for a lot of the work I've been doing over, you know, for the past five years is I, I try to be as, as completest as possible. I think people have been enjoying 
at least my approach, you know, um, if, if there's a popular record, if there's like an anniversary for something coming up, we, we try to, you know, surround it with all of these other versions of, of a particular track or, um, one of the things I, I, I really liked was, uh, uh, the hot rats box that we did, you kind of get a sense of how Frank assembled that record. Um, and there's so much you know, goodness in there. Uh, but a lot, of, a lot of the material that I work on, that's the fun part, right? Is you're like an archeologist. I get to hear the odds and ends where Frank is talking or laughing, which is always a feel good moment. Mm, yeah. Um, Wonderful. You know, and, yeah. Those, those are great. I mean, when you come across audio, where it's him like walking through the house, um, you you know I go right back to I'm like wow I it's crazy I know where he's walking right now I, I like I hear yes. a gate open and I'm like that's bananas I know exactly where he is in time and space and I'm, I'm, and and you know it's this it's a weird sense memory to know like, Oh, he's about to walk into their bedroom and up. Oh, that feels about right. The amount of time it took him to get to like his bed and then start tickling my mom or my little sister's there. And you know, you, you hear, uh, there's a lot of that stuff, which is priceless to me. I don't know if it'd be interesting to other people because it's so much silliness, but um, there are those kinds of things again, prepping the media and the stuff that we do for release, that's, that's all really creative fun, but there's all this administration stuff that is, you know, more 90% of, um, of the time. It's a lot of responsibility. And I, I, you know, I try to listen as much as possible to, to the fans and try to get a sense of, varying the kinds of releases that we have you know zappa 88 being one of them where i was like wow we we haven't really done something in the from that time period in a while and uh yeah so i have moments where i'll you know i'll put up the releases in my own kind of calendar and we can shuffle those things around because we try to do three to four you know big releases a year and you know that kind of gives me a working framework so, you know, people ask me about things. I'm like, yeah, they're coming. And it's, it hasn't been too often that we kind of change what we're, you know, what we're, what we're deciding, but we're a few years ahead of, the, of what we want to do. You know, presumably there are, there are completists who, who have absolutely all of it, who collect everything. There, there are, which is, which is, I'm sure I'm a huge disappointment to you know people watching this right now. I don't know what they know you know what i mean they're well, i'm, I'm sure you i'm sure you're right educated yeah. yeah was yeah. frank was frank surprised it always interested me when he when he's recording the beef up uh, they made a recording for dot records i think were turned down until they had no yeah. commercial potential i remember he put that those words on the cover of freak out and i i always wondered did he do that because he was resentful about the fact that he thought this did have commercial potential or was he completely aware that his music was very very experimental and he was kind of lucky to find a backer which do you think <laughs> I th I think the latter. I think he was completely aware. Yeah, I, you know, I, he he was inspired by the music in his head, and you know, and put it down. And some things made a record, or they didn't, or it, it, they didn't feel like they were, I guess, part of you know that moment of you know in time. Uh, but he just, he never stopped writing music. He's never stopped recording music. He recorded so many of his concerts and each night, um, which, you know, the, I think the fans know this. We, we put out records from the road and there's so many different interpretations of these songs. And I'm often asked like, Oh, you do have a favorite record and you know, it changes, but, but for the last couple of years, I, I go back to Philly 76 because there's this woman, Lady Bianca, who, um, you know, was in the band for a moment and and hearing her sing songs I've heard sung by mostly you know men um, and just the just the grooviness of the of 1976. It's mm. just an awesome record. So, you know, I, I'd love to put more of that out. Um, because we have 
we have more of it. So that's just on, on like a personal bucket list. Right. You know, I know. Have you, have you, are you noticing, uh, you know, cause presumably the, the people who played on the records with him certainly back in the day will be passing on slowly, you know, and, and so mm-hmm. the original fan base will pass on. Have you noticed it moving to a new, a new generation? Is the, is this happening? Yeah. Um, I mean, I've been very hard at work and, you know, I mean, most people wouldn't realize this, but, uh, you know, I think we were just behind Metallica in terms of sales over the last year. And, um, you know, I've, I've really worked hard to create more awareness around Frank's music. And I'm proud to say that, uh, you know, a lot more people have, have been discovering, discovering him and, and it just, the, it's just going up and up and up, which I'm really proud of because I think people, more people should know his music and, and his thoughts and his politics and his sense of humor and all of that. And you can find a lot of it. I suppose it's a fantastic thing to to imagine a 21 year old nowadays, suddenly discovering Frank Zappa because you've, you've got this entire world that you can can spend the rest of your life just going through Marvel films. (laughs) (laughs) That's months of your life going to be taken care of. Absolutely. Astonishing. Yeah. You know, um just just because back to the question of more people discovering you know we we really do have a very loyal fan base people that love love frank um uh and i get reports you know because i i have a really great relationship with you know my partnership with universal and i'm always interested in how they're slicing and dicing and getting analysis on this or that and, you know, you can get some interesting details from the streaming services and who's listening and what the, the segmentation, it's all boring stuff, which is, I mean, it's, it's interesting to me, but probably boring the way I'm talking about it. Uh, but it, it lets me know, like, the fans are getting younger um, and the, you know, the people that are listening to it now um, are consuming, it's, it's honestly, it's more people... I think the, the the greatest number of folks are between like 30 and, and, you know, like 45, you know, thereabouts. And, you know, it's kind of, I'm a little bit older than that number now, but that's a good, you know, good, good feeling. Cause uh, those, those people will have the opportunity to, you know, hear other people play his music and, uh, they're the ones that are really interested in the other a- elements that are in the vault. And I would have thought, you know, before that a lot of, uh, a lot of the fans would, would be older than that. And we still have those, those fans. So, but I, it, it, it's, you know, not too surprising to me that, um, you know, I, I have a, I have a, uh, a job ahead of me to try to get, you know, ten-year-olds to listen. Yeah, to Yeah, absolutely. Music. Well, I, you know, just, I don't. You know, I don't see that they, happening. Are people but still? I don't mean, know. You, that's probably what they said about Marvel comics about forty years yeah. ago, isn't it? You know what I mean? These yeah. things get reborn in all kinds of ways. I was going to ask you actually because I think the most streamed Beatles song is "Here Comes the Sun," which wasn't even a hit. Right. Uh, because because people a younger generation approach it in different ways you know they're coming at it not chronologically or anything like that what are the most streamed frank zappa recordings um you know i should have that information on re- on total recall but I, but i don't i do have this interesting tidbit which most uh, artists have four or five songs that are um associated with you know those groups yeah that that are really key and uh frank is abnormal in that there is there's actually 19 songs <laughs> that really are, yeah um that are the most frequently played it's it he he just doesn't fit into any mold right, uh, right. which doesn't which doesn't surprise me in terms of you know like the, the He's just made so much music. You, it's hard for me to recommend someone who doesn't know my dad. Uh, I'm like, well, what kind of music do you like? 
So it's a different answer. If they're jazz heads, then I'm like, oh, all right, I can I try this, you know, or look, I like classic rock. I'm like, all right, well, you know, try this. Do and, people still buy uh, the albums? Do they still buy the, the self-contained albums? Because when I was about products, 20, the, the yeah, the, yeah, because the big yeah. ones, I suppose, when, when we were young, were Hot Rats and Overnight Sensation Apostrophe, yeah. maybe Shake Your Booty. And those were the kind of, seemed to us to be the big commercial ones. Are they still as popular now? Or, or, or what's, yeah. which ones are still? Yeah, like? those yeah. are those are still popular records. And, and we really pride ourselves on the physical product that we make. And that's a very strong aspect of, of what we do you know that really hasn't died off and i can't speak for other artists but you know when people do talk about digital and streaming and um you know we're my job is to try to grow that awareness for for people who consume music that way but um i just love that they're vinyl collectors and people who still want the physical you know product uh you know it just sounds better and we put a lot of love, time, and energy into the things that we that we make that for physical re- releases. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm I'm happy that that we have that people respond to that for us. It's you know we have a again we're like archaeologists. We put so much detail, yeah. and we try to be completist. And I like all that. We try to make everything really special. And then, you know, sometimes I'm like, all right, well, let's just, <laughs> let's just do something a little, uh, a little easier because, <laughs> because it, you know, it takes so much time and energy to, to, to do this. So, you know, you, you know, when there's like just two, two albums, <laughs> then we're like, yeah, no, we needed a break yeah, yeah. just for, <laughs> for, yeah. for, for this, this moment. In time. I, I was thinking so. today, I was just thinking that, that I couldn't think of anybody remotely like him. It's funny, there was, a, there was an interview with Bunk Gardner I saw once. Bunk Gardner said yeah. uh, we could play 300 songs at the drop of a hat. Mm. This is the touring band. And he said yeah. he, we had to memorise it all because he wouldn't let us use music. And then he'd make these signs with his fingers saying whether we changed yeah. from five, eight time to seven, eight time, just like that. And he would jump up in the air when he landed up back down again, we'd have to start another song. Now, the amount of discipline in that one paragraph is absolutely incredible. It made me think, I, I, even in the worlds of jazz and, and soul, I couldn't think of a more demanding band leader, which is amazing. Yeah. Is, it? is there anyone remotely like him? I, th- I, don't, I don't know. I don't think so. I no, mean, I it's easier to say, no. I don't think so, but I, I really do try to think of uh, another person who's like that. I, I don't know if Prince had the same sort of rehearsal schedule. That's interesting. I don't, yes. Yeah, I, I don't know. I know he was definitely recording all the time, but I, I don't know if it was the same sort of discipline. Um, and I, I like I, I I'm trying to just reassess how I categorize things too in my own life and in how I, you know, the questions are being asked of me, right? So as an example, um, if when someone like that question. Is there anyone else like him? The thing that I start immediately thinking uh, is, well, I go back to the time and and the way that people perceive how a band should rehearse, right? <laughs> like how much time that they don't put into being extra creative or being masters of their instruments, right? So th- that becomes the the more interesting thing to me. Is like, wow. You know, people always talk about, you know, they rehearsed all the time. They're like really prepared. And then, and then you listen to the concerts, they could, they sound like they could be record releases. You want to know why? It's mm. because they rehearsed the shit out of, I don't know if I can swear, sorry. They That's rehearsed right, the right. hell out of the music. And then you're, and then you go, like, well, that makes sense. And then when people are complaining about it, you know, like, oh yeah, we had to rehearse all the time. Like, but you sound amazing. Yes, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. like, you know, he wanted to get the best out of these people and he did. So that to me is, is it also fascinating that, that Frank, um, the, the players themselves, even though they played an instrument, they, you know, they themselves were instruments for him, you know, in, in that he knew how he could push people to be the best that they could be. And assembling that mix and being able to have them 
for you know for the way he wanted to hear something for his for for the audience entertainment amusement or just for him to be like i'd like to hear this piece of music that i've written a different way to be able to met like you know use your like a jedi <laughs> you know like a, i always say that frank was not a musician but a musician like a magical <laughs> musician um uh you know that i think is really is really unique so i love the music i i, I think that um Again, I, I like when people discover his orchestral music. Certainly, the, you know the stuff that is more electrified with his rock bands. Uh, but he's so funny, and, and the stories that he's telling are interesting because yeah. it's his point of view around subjects that are not about love songs. They're about you know things that happened to him or people in the band or what's going on in the world that are still relevant today. Um, so. I, I think he's one of the most important artists of all time. No, but I'm biased, enough. right? Absolutely. Yeah. Can I ask yeah. one more question about his early life? There's an amazing incident in 1965 when he he went to jail. When he he was yeah. he was uh, he was stitched up by a, an undercover vice squad officer uh, yeah. who commissioned him to make a whatever it was, supposedly a pornographic tape for a stag party, and was then arrested and put in jail. And it, it appeared to have an amazing effect on his attitude to life and, and the world generally. He never trusted authority. He never trusted the establishment. Would you say that was true? Did you ever talk to him about that incident? Um, not, not at length. Uh, I mean, we, we, he, he sh shared that information. I'm certainly aware of, of the, the circumstances. I mean, my opinion, I didn't ask him if like, Hey, did this create a, a distrust of, of, uh, you know, government. Um, I think it was more of an eye opener that people take advantage of, yeah. of, you know, people and it's unjust or it can certainly be unjust. And, that I'm also really proud of. Like, you know, so my, my father to me is, is an underdog in so many ways. You know, this is someone who's written songs that could easily be played on what is now like classic radio, but he mm. was blacklisted. You know, there's tons of music that, that I think is very commercial. Not that he was trying to write commercial tunes. This is just my, you know, me as I, as someone who really likes listening to classic rock, I'm like, it's just strange to me that my dad's music is never, you know, being played in that same um, context when they rock equally as hard. Yeah. And so my point in, in mentioning that is, you know, my, my father always had, um, he was colorblind. He, um, I mean, in terms of people in his band, um, you know, he didn't see race. He saw uh, people with immense talent and, um, so I, I feel like he had a sense of, uh, you know, how unjust things were that way. Yeah. So I, I, I'm feel blessed that we were raised in a household with, with different values and, and very supportive of the arts. And my parents were very generous and very helpful to uh, a lot of folks. Um, I mean, you know, the, the biggest issue that he, that they ever had was people just kind of betraying their trust, you know, yeah. and their privacy, which I think is really normal. People, you know, when they talk about Frank, like if they feel like, you know, there was something negative there, I'm like, well, chances are that person, it's pretty basic. He's just a macho Italian dude. So, mm. you know, if you betray the trust, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're out of luck, you know? Um, but I don't know. I was going off on a tangent, but you know, there's as a father of two little ones, uh, my son turned five yesterday. My, my daughter is, is 10. Um, I do reflect often on, on what it was like having my parents as parents. And now that I'm a parent, um, you know, kind of, I can, I can definitely feel where I make similar choices and where I have made different ones, you know? They, 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 I want to ask you a little bit more mm. about this because my uh, my experience of being a parent is that your your children are not impressed by you at all because you're their father. You're just there 100%. all the time. Yeah. Was it the same with Frank? Or were you aware, my father is 
He's a bit of a legend. He's a lot of a legend, even then, when you were small. Were you aware of this? Um, I mean, to me, my dad could have easily just been a plumber or a, um, you know, a mailman or something like it, just because it was my normal, right? He played music. So I didn't know that that was some that was different. You know, I, I wasn't, I didn't have that feeling. But did he come it, and you pick know? you up from school or anything like that? I mean, he couldn't have looked like the conventional no. dad. He, he didn't do, he didn't do <laughs> he that. He didn't do any no. of that. He's no, too busy no. in the studio. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was, I mean, if that, that maybe, I don't think it happened. I can't remember if it did, but maybe he was in the car. The idea of him, yeah, no. That, no, that, <laughs> no, I don't. He didn't come yeah, to school sports day or anything like that. <laughs> Uh, well, he didn't drive, so oh, well, that would that. make a difference. <laughs> um, but he could. I mean, he used to have a license, but he just decided, like, yeah, I'm never going to do that again. Like that was weird. That I was aware of. That was stranger than what he did for a job, actually. Um, so, you know, if we wanted to go somewhere, if my mother was gone, you, you know, Frank would just be there working and he'd be just hanging out in the, in the rare moment where he was taking a break or something. Uh, you know, the only game I think I ever played with him was pickup sticks, which I really liked. And I used to be like, God damn it. He can keep his hands so steady. <laughs> you know, like you can't, it's impossible to beat at, uh, at pickup sticks or at least it's what we call it. Is that called Mikado or something? You know, you know what I'm talking uh, about? I, I, I know the thing you mean. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. You let go. Um, and then you pick up. Yeah. He, you know, he'd go to an occasional baseball game or a school play or something. If we were, you know, playing sports, but it was very infrequent. Right. He, we would go to the movies that I loved because my dad, uh, I, you know, I've always, I think had a, a certain uh, desire to um, have a uh, easier time, you know? So, and I'm pretty, I'm like a chatty, chatty person anyways, if you can't tell. So I be I would become friends with people like that work the door in a movie theater. So as as a teenager, you know, people would be waiting in the line and be like, "Listen, all right, teenager, I will bring you a beer next time if you'll just let me in early because I want to see Pee Wee's Playhouse." Right? As an example, and uh, you know, my dad would be waiting in the car. And he's like, what is he doing? Because I left. I'm like, I got this. Don't worry. We're not going to have to wait in line. I got this, right? <laughs> and so I'm like, yeah, come on. We go to the same school. We play the same video games, the bowling alley. <laughs> you know, so those guys are like, all right. You know, so I'm like, okay, I'll be right back. And then, you know, my family gets out of the car. I'm like, you yeah, know, come on. We're like going into the back of the, of the, um, of the theater. I just remember my dad, uh, like, who are you <laughs> you know in, the, in that sort of a moment like, see i got you i hooked you up it's all good Let's do this <laughs> you know? so, yeah, what, yeah well that that would th those are the fun moments because they were so few and far between and i'm like wow i'm going to a, a a movie with my dad where actually like i drove him or that was so rare that I mean, I'm make, you're making me think about that. I, I haven't thought about that in, in a long time. Um, yeah, funny. Because yeah, that, it, I, it, because he had a, a work that was so kind of all encompassing. It was like being a professional athlete or something like that. You know, that's what they do all the time, and it takes up an immense amount of time, doesn't it? I want I want to ask you about yeah. the the um, you, you you've the documentary made by Alex Winter. Which yeah. came out in the in within the last year, uh, which is available to stream and so forth. Uh, and when the, he approached you about doing that, you said, "Well, that's going to take a long time. We've you know we've had approaches before. We've never done that kind of thing. And obviously, mm -hmm. that's come out. And you must be very happy with that. Is there anything else that you keep getting approached with, and you think, mm, no, I don't know. We we don't dare that." do that i don't know whether it's a stage show or a feature film or whatever the other what are the yeah. what are the what are the strange possibilities that you entertain um I, I mean the things that people ask for that we don't kind of already you know do um and we're trying to be better at it is having more 
um, you know, orchestral pieces, scores that that people can, um, you know, rent or experience. And that's that's just a time consuming, you know, process and a costly process, and certainly not my skill set. So there's very few people that we would trust with with you know giving them the music to contextualize it and and to to make the parts. Um, so I get asked about that, you know, um, pretty frequently. Uh, well, I mean, a couple times a year, and we and we are we're going to make strides to to make more music available um, and easier for people to to get who want to play Frank's music, which I want. You know that that's you know I think that people should um, have that uh, if should they just should they choose. Um, but you know, the doc was something that was constantly being talked about, I think because it's, it's easier, it's, it's kind of less reliant in many ways on, on the assets that we have, if that makes sense. Um, and cause there's a lot of sources you can, I guess, pull things from, mm -hmm. but it, but at least the meetings I sat in, uh, with with my mother before Alex started the the doc, uh, it just wasn't the right fit. And you know, my mother would, I guess, bring me in to be another set of ears. And uh, so when Alex called me, because I'd known Alex for many years, asking if there why hasn't why hadn't there been a definitive doc? Uh, I said, well, it's not for a lack of trying. The best I can do is is you know, invite you up for tea with my mother and, you know, we can really try to you know talk through this. And, and Alex is an exceptional filmmaker and human being. Um, he was very prepared. He really instinctively knew what he wanted to do. And that, that really resonated with my mother. And, you know, it, it did take a while. We had so many starts and stops and ups and downs. One being my mother passing through the process, but, uh, you know, I love the movie. I think he did a great job. I think it's really honest. And that was for my mother and I, we were like, look, with the movie that you want to do, which we're, you know, we don't like censorship, so we're not going to even censor ourselves. And we wanted to make sure that people understood that even though if we're involved in it, it's not something that, you know, we're, we're trying to, um, it's not a puff piece, you know, we, 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 it was really important for us, like warts and all. But if we had one thing that we hoped that Alex would do was to try to contextualize the life of a composer, you know, and, and, you know, get, Alex is a very confident filmmaker and really had strong feelings and, 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 um, you know, the media really helped dictate and shape the story for him. So once he had all this access, it, 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 it allowed him to go into different, um, you know, areas with, with the story he wanted to tell. And, you know, I just, I'm really proud of the film. I know my mother would be proud. I think my, my dad, not that he, you know, would like his ego stroked in that way. So I'm making a biopic on him, you know, uh, I don't think he would do something like that. In, you know, in his lifetime, like yeah, someone should make a movie about my life. I don't, that, <laughs> I don't, I don't see that being those words in that way coming out of his mouth. But I do think he would be proud of 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 the film. Um, I, I mean, I, I love it. So again, I'm biased, though. No, that, that's fair. You're allowed to be biased. Let, let, <laughs> let, and I, that, let's uh, thank you very much for talking to us. What we traditionally do now, I know you don't have any stuff around you here. We always ask people to tell us what's the best record ever made. But in your case, what do you think is the best Frank Zappa record? If you had to choose one, you've mentioned 76 earlier on. Is there anything else? Well, I can show you a few things. Oh, go on. What you got? Stupidly. I'm sure someone sent me the information about, uh, you know, <laughs> what you what you do on the show. Does but here's <laughs> here's uh so the red one was my dad's and the blue one was mine. Oh, wow. oh that's lovely. <laughs> and and uh so that um that uh rat tamago, I drew my dad a picture 
And, I, and he's like, what is that? I'm like, it's a rat tamago. And he laughed and laughed. And then he wrote a song about it. Uh, and so then we had our matching shirts. You know, that kind of gives you a little context of what a like huggy bear kind of a guy he was. Uh, my middle name is Rodan, named after, <laughs> you know, oh, uh, brilliant. Uh, one of the monsters. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I can show you this. If you, you know, this is before he passed. I don't know if you can check that out. Can you read that? I can't. I can see, really. I can see the letterhead. I can't it? see. Uh, it's it just dear, it's dear the letterhead. All oh, right, okay. Yeah. You see that? Dear Armit, I love you, your dad. Oh. oh, that's so sweet. That's lovely. Yeah. That's beautiful. So. Didn't you write a song with him once? A rat tomorrow. A rat tomorrow. Oh, that, that right. one. That's and the that, one? I thought there was one called Frog Frogs with Dirty Little Lips. That one too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's the how was it writing a song with your father? How, what was the process? And it's just storytelling. He's more like the Inquisition. You know, once he started laughing, he wanted to kind of go down, um, you know, mine, mine the laughter. Yeah. So I, I always like to say that comedy was a currency in our household. You know, I love to make him laugh. So, yeah. you, you know, that those were the moments that would then turn into songs. Yeah. So, you know, like that's how Frogs are Dirty Little Lips. He, I it was given... I think it was by a guy named Muzzy, right? Muzzy gave me a red bucket filled with tadpoles. And I mean, like hundreds and hundreds of like swamp water. And I was like, what is this? And they were, they turned into baby frogs. And that was the, one of the best things that, that ever, ever happened to me as a kid. <laughs> And I would check it. It's just just smelled bad. And, you know, I was really excited to show my dad and my mom and everyone, you know, the baby frogs. And, and I it started with like, I just want to kiss their dirty little lips. I was obsessed with them. Uh, and, you know, I would just tell him stories about this bucket of frogs I now had. And then we, we released them into our, into our garden. Um, so that's really how that song came about. But it was, it was, you know, him, tell me more about it. Tell me more stories about it. And then he, he was the one who kind of jotted it all down and put it to, put it to, well, how, you know, how great to music. I had a, a co-composition with him. That's fantastic. Absolutely. Really well, good. Lovely to talk to you, Ahmed. We, we